Today we're going to be talking about a little bit of math, exponents, scientific notation, significant figures, and a calculation technique I call railroad track. Okay, so we'll start off with exponents. Um, I don't know exactly how much exponents you've gotten, but all we're talking about with exponents is this superscript that is written next to a number, next to an up. And so that's just saying, I'm going to take two and I'm going to multiply it by itself three times. Technically, what this is, is two to the third equals two times two times two over one. Okay, I'm telling you that because that is not what the negative sign means. The negative sign is what I have here. It's the exact same thing, except everything's in the denominator. So instead of multiplying by two, three times, I'm actually dividing by two, three times. Okay, so this is gonna to apply directly to our next topic, which is scientific notation. So scientific notation is a way to write a number um, usually it's because the number is really big or really small, but there are other reasons to write it in scientific notation. Um, there's another term called engineering notation, and it's a teeny bit different, but um, scientific notation is what we're going to use. You write a number, whatever the first number is, a decimal place, all the rest of the numbers, and then the multiplication sign times, um, and then 10, and then to an exponent. So there's a number, there's a decimal place, these are the rest of the numbers, there's the multiplication sign, there's a 10, and then there's my exponent. All right, well, after talking about exponents, what does 10 to the fifth mean? It's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. And since it's a positive 5, then it's going to be a numerator number. So great. I take 1.25 and I multiply it by 10 five times. What happens when I multiply a number by 10? I really just move the decimal place over. 1.25 uh, 1 turns into 12.5. 12.5 turns into 125. And if I did that five times, I get this 125,000 number. Okay, so we can see this again in the 5.82 times 10 to the third. I move the decimal place over three spots. One, oops, one two, three, and I put a zero right there. And we've got 5,280. But what if it's a negative value? So then this is 8.34 times one over 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. All of this is in the denominator. So I'm gonna, multi I'm gonna divide 8.34 by 10 four times. And that's gonna move my decimal place over one, two, three, four spots, zero, zero, zero. All right, and that's the number we have here. So you can see this next example of why I'd want to write scientific notation because the number is massive. So I don't want to have to write these 21 zeros. That doesn't sound like fun to me. So instead of doing that, I'm just going to write in scientific notation. Um, this would be, there's my thousands, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, pentillions. And so that's 602 hexillion. That's a ridiculously big number that we need in chemistry. So instead of writing that out, I'm just going to write the 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. In your calculator, what you would do is, if it's a TI calculator, um, well, most calculators, this works just like this. Uh, if I want to type this number in, I type uh, 1.25, and then either the E, 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 or the E, X, P. Sometimes I see a 10 to the X key, and then 5. On uh, my TI-89 calculator, it looked like, hey, where did that image go? One second. Somehow I must have undone that. Control, control C, come back over here. And control B. All right, well, it's somewhere. Moved everything. Oh my God. Ooh, it's huge. All righty. <laughs> so there you see my 1.25E5, and then I get this 125,000 number um, written. Uh, and the key is this EE key right here. I'm going to remove that because that's annoying. All righty. Um, so that's it for scientific notation. So let's talk about the next topic, which is called significant figures. So it's, it's not a very good name. All, all numbers are um, fairly significant. 
but let's uh, let's talk about an example. So this is a picture of an ultimate frisbee field, or an, a graphic of an ultimate frisbee field. 20, 20 yard wide, uh, deep end zone, seventy yard field. So let's say that I start off over here and I put a cone down, and then I take twenty steps and I put another cone down, and then I take thirty five steps and I put the center cone down. Awesome. Okay. So then a friend of mine's helping me set up the field. And this friend of mine standing over here, he puts a tape measure down right here at the cone. He runs the tape measure out, puts another cone down, runs the tape measure out 35 and puts another cone down. What's the distance of this field? Is it 70 plus 20 plus 20? So 110 yards. How accurate is it? Well, for this person over here, this 20 and these 35 yards, it's probably accurate within, I don't know, like two centimeters, right? But over here, this is accurate as well as my steps. So maybe let's say I'm off by one full, uh, one half of a step. Well, that's um, 50 centimeters. So I did a poor job of measuring the distance from this end of this end zone to the midfield. And this person did a terrific job on their end. How accurate is my measurement? Well, it's off by plus or minus 50 centimeters. Well, this guy was only off plus or minus two centimeters. Well, all that matters is the worst measurement. And that's what significant figures is about. The worst measurement is as accurate as my answer could be. If you're trying to make chocolate chip cookies, when you're making chocolate chip cookies, you need um, two and uh, one quarter cups of flour. Let's say that I went and got myself a uh, nice cup of flour, perfectly cleaned off the top, filled up to the brim, and I dumped that in the bowl. But the other person just takes you can see I'm an amazing drawer here. Just takes a handful of flour and throws it in there and says, all right, that's the other cup and a quarter. It's not very accurate. Even though mine is perfectly accurate to one cup, 1.0 cups, this person over here is gonna be way off. So how much got put in? It's uh, equivalent to the worst measurement. So when I'm doing calculations, I have to take into account the worst measurement and that's as accurate as I can do. So why would somebody wanna measure something inaccurately? All right, so the example I'll give are the, the um, weight measures that they have for trucks, for semi-trucks. So um, semi-trucks need to make sure that the axles only have their rated weight and no more, otherwise the vehicle could have accidents. So here in the gorge, we get trucks tipping over and causing all kinds of problems. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, SR-14 was closed for like seven hours because the truck tipped over, um, took a corner too much, I don't know, or too fast. I don't know if the, it was overweighted or not. But um, here's an image of what one of these truck weigh scales would look like. Each of those um, circles is showing a different portion of the scale. So if a truck rolls onto here, it's gonna tell you how much weight is on each one of the axles. Okay, fine. Um, do you think that the person who is measuring these axles wants to know that the axle weight is approximately, I just looked up what the weights for trucks are and it looks like um, 17,000 17, per axle. Um, that's pounds, it is pretty common. So when they drive over that scale, do you think that the scale will measure like, it's 16,532.293 pounds. That doesn't make any sense. I don't really care about that or that or that or that or that, frankly, maybe there. So what I've got is a scale that can measure 10, uh, 10, 000, um, more than 10,000 pounds, but can't measure 100 pound increments. So what the scale, what that scale probably reads is it can read 
16,500 pounds, and it could read 16,400 pounds or 16,600 pounds. Everything is in 100 pound increments. Okay, so how does that apply? Well, these are placeholders. These numbers are not significant. They're significant in the fact that that shows you how large the number is. But the reason that they're insignificant is I have no idea what those numbers are. It could be zero, zero. They could be nine, nine. They could be five, eight. It doesn't matter. What I do know is I know that number, that number, and that number. So I know the significance of the weight to the most important numbers, which are the three largest numbers. Okay. So how does this work with the math? So I'm going to talk about the rules, and then we're going to go over some examples. Any non-zero numbers are always going to be significant. Any zeros that are sandwiched between two numbers are significant. Trailing zeros have two rules. If the trailing zero in the value is to the right of the decimal place, the zero is significant. If the trailing zero is to the left of the decimal place, the zero is only significant if followed by a decimal point. So that sounds a little bit complicated, but rule number one, all non-zeros are significant. So this number has three significant figures. Whatever this measurement is, let's say it's grams. This scale actually read 547 grams. Awesome. This is about rule number two. There is a zero in there, but it's sandwiched between a six and an eight. So this scale actually read 6,084 grams. All right, what about this scale? Is that zero significant there? And the answer would be yes. This scale reads to three decimal places. If you were in the lab, we've got some blue scales that read to three decimal places. So this actually just happened to fall on the zero. It could have been um, 23.591 or 23.89, but in this case, it landed right on the zero. But that is a significant value because you, if you were looking at a scale, and the scale you were looking at said 23.59, and that's all that you, you saw on the scale, grams, you would not write 23.590. That you just wouldn't do that because, I mean, why would I write that? I don't know that. And so in a scale that only has two decimal places, I don't know what this next number is. But the scale we're talking about must have known what that number was. It must have measured it and then told me, yeah, it just happened to stop at the zero. So this has five significant figures. So this, um, this is A for rule three. It's on the right of the decimal place, and it's showing you that that zero is important. So this is rule B. This only has two significant figures. So this scale can read 670 grams, and then the next increment would be 680 grams, or I could go down to 660 grams. But it can't read, say, 672 grams. This number. It can't read that. And for the same reason that I don't really care about the individual pounds when I'm measuring the uh, amount of weight in a, on a truck axle, in this case, the person did not care about the ones place. But this one did. This one's reading the individual uh, single numbers here. And so to indicate that, they put a decimal place down. So we're saying that this thing read to the, to the ones place. And so let's count all five of those as significant. Okay, so how do I use this with uh, addition and subtraction? So let's say that um, you're measuring up masses of different substances that you're going to put into um, a beaker or whatever, a container of some kind. So I have all of these masses measured in grams, and I want to know what the total mass of this is. Well, I have this one that was really accurately measured and pretty accurate and kind of accurate and not so accurate. I add them all up as if there were no differences in significant figures. And then I draw a line right here where I've got this red line and I cut off everything because I don't know what this number is right here. It could be a zero, it could be a nine. So that throws off all of these numbers don't matter because I don't know what that number is. So my answer for this is just gonna be 1802.9 and I don't care about the other ones. All right, so that's addition and subtraction. I just line up the decimal places and add and then cut everything off up to the worst measurement. And then, so for multiplication, I'm gonna multiply all these numbers together. What you do is you look at the numbers in the multiplication and determine, okay, two sig figs, three, five, four, three. The worst 
measurement is two significant figures. My answer, even though when I typed it into the calculator, I got that, the answer that I have to put down is three, two, zero, zero. How many significant figures are here? Two, just that and that. Another way I could write this would be 3.2 times 10 to the third. Well, we'll say this is grams. Doesn't really matter what it is. So this shows the person that there are two significant figures here. This is still a little ambiguous because I'm not so sure about the significance of the tens place, but I'm positive that that one right there is insignificant. So if I know I'm only going to two sig figs, the best way to write it is scientific notation. Then there's no ambiguity whatsoever. So again, this is about um, your worst measurement in the calculation. And that calculation um, answer can only be as good as the worst measurement. So remember, this isn't math, math. All of these things have real world applications. All of these things were measured. There aren't, uh, we're not just making numbers up and then having everything get multiplied together and whatnot. All right, so last thing we're gonna talk about um, topics wise is something I call the railroad track method. Other people call it dimensional analysis or factor label method. This is the way I do, do math. All, all my calculations, I, I use this method instead of using uh, equations because I don't have to memorize equations. I don't want to. So what I'm going to do here is set up a method to allow me to know what to do next, basically. So here's my example. I've got uh, miles and I want to turn miles. I'm going to turn that into kilometers. Okay, so I started off with 9.8 miles. I want to turn that into kilometers. So what I have here is a starting value and each of these are fractions. And then I take the fractions and I multiply and divide whatever I started with. So why is it okay for me to write this? Because the numerator and the denominator are equal to each other. So this is equal to one. Numerator, denominator equal to one. Numerator, denominator equal to one. Numerator, denominator equal to one, equal to one. So I'm not really doing anything. The numerator and denominator are equal to themselves. So this is technically equal to one. But what I'm doing is I'm getting my conversion to give me the answer that I want. So I'm starting off here with 8.9 miles. I don't want miles. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write miles in the denominator because when I write miles in the denominator, I know I'm gonna be able to cancel out the miles in the numerator and I've done that. So what I do is I have miles and I turn that into feet. Okay, awesome. Feet doesn't seem to be closer to kilometers but it will get me closer because I need to get rid of a feet now. So it goes in the denominator here and I put inches up top. So now my feet have been canceled out. If I stop my math right here, like if I didn't have any of this, this would tell me how many inches are in 9.8 miles. Not super important, but that's what would happen. So I don't want to do that. So I'm going to keep going. And the reason that we went this direction is because in the conversion factors for um, lengths in the handbook that comes out of the metric system, it says that 2.54 centimeters is equal to one inch. And it says exact. All right, so we're not going to go through from kilometers straight into miles or vice versa. We're gonna go through centimeters and I'm gonna to wanna to see this math whenever you do this. So now that I'm in centimeters, I can go centimeters to meters and then I can go meters to kilometers. Okay, so then I take everything in the numerator. So 9.8, 5,280, 12, 2.54, and then everything in the denominator, 100 and 1,000, I multiply them together and I get this. Okay, well, this isn't actually my answer. I've got 9.8, that's the only thing uh, if I'm talking about significant figures, there's two sig figs there. So my answer is actually 16 kilometers. So you might ask yourself, well, wait a second. I see one significant figure here and here and here and here and here. So isn't it one sig fig? And the answer would be no. The reason I'm not concerned about it is, let's look at this one right here. This is 12 inches equals one foot. Is there any wiggle room in that? Is it ever 12.1 or 11.9 or 1.01 feet? No, this is a definition. So you can put as many, you can put 1.0000 until the cows come home and 12.0000, as many as you want here. But um, ultimately, since this is a definition, there's an infinite number of significant figures. So when I look at this conversion, I don't have to think about sig figs. 
This is a definition. Don't have to think about that. Don't have to think about it. Don't have to think about it. And we don't have to think about this one because the metric system said that's exact. So I don't have to worry about significant figures in that 2.54 centimeters is an inch. Oh, okay, so let's do another one of these examples. Sorry, I've got a puppy and that puppy is working at our older dog. Hey, get out. So uh, the other example I have here is um, speed. So I wanna go from miles per hour into feet per second. So we've got 22 miles per hour and I wanna convert the 22, the 22 miles per hour. I wanna convert that into feet per second. So I'm gonna go with, um, let's say, let's convert the hours first. So 60, sorry. That's wrong. One hour is equal to 60 minutes. So why did I write it like that? Because I need hours to cancel out. So I have a numerator and denominator. All right, so I don't want minutes. So I know I need to cancel minutes. So I need to write minutes in the numerator and then I can get myself to seconds. So one minute, 60 seconds. And then I can go ahead and cancel out the minutes. So I've got one of the units that I want. I've got the seconds unit. So let's get the, uh, the feet unit. So now I've got one mile and I wrote the one mile down here because it's um, the thing that I'm trying to cancel is here in the numerator. So I put the mile down here in the denominator and I have 5,280 feet. And so now I can cancel out my miles. And the only units that I have that haven't been canceled are seconds and feet. So if I do the math on this, I'm gonna end up with uh, 32.3 feet per second, but it's only two sig figs. So this turns into 32 feet per second. And so this is how I do all of my calculations. They're all gonna look like this. Um, even if it's got an equation, I use this railroad track method. I use the units from the real world to facilitate a calculation that I want. And so we'll talk about this continuously when we talk about density in the next section. And anytime we're talking about a calculation, we're gonna be talking about this railroad track technique. Um, typically, I've got a lot of students that are trying to get into the healthcare field, nursing, CNA, um, now that we've got an EMT program, EMT. So I'm gonna show you why the railroad track method works. Um, for the nursing people, when you get into the nursing program, one of the first things that you're gonna do is take something called a pro-calc test. It stands for professional calculations. And um, they, have, they use, uh, pro-calc is a company that sells math tests to people. Um, so let's say that you're a general contractor and you need to hire a carpenter and you've got two people, they seem to be equally qualified good references. And so you, um, you have them take the pro calc test for carpenters, whichever one gets a better score, maybe you use them because if the person makes a mistake in their carpenter calculations, you might have to buy another piece of wood or a bunch of pieces of wood because they, uh, they did their calculations incorrect. In healthcare, the difference is maybe a person dies or you make a person really sick. So we'll, let's look at this example here. When I see these calculations, um, to me, I just see numbers in units. And so for you, these are word problems that you probably weren't super, well, most people do not like these in math class, but this is a chemistry class. So all of our problems are word problems. So um, the first thing that you do when you see a problem is, what am I looking for? Okay. I am looking for how many milliliters are going to be drawn out of this ampule. The ampule has this drug called Depravera. It's a um, long-term birth control. Person gets a shot in three to six months. They don't have to take any birth control. So it's uh, this, um, when you see this down here, you know that this own, you're looking at a steroid. So if you give the person the wrong amount of steroid, you could cause all kinds of problems. They could be biological, they could be um, mental. Um, so you definitely want to be given the correct amount. 
So in this case, it says um, 35 grams of Depravera must be prepared. Okay, so you need a container with 35 grams. The problem is this is a solution. And so you, it becomes a little bit more difficult with the solution. You don't wanna put it on a scale and measure that out. In this case, you're gonna use a volume to determine how many grams that you need. So this 0.35 grams, what I've got, I've got a 10 milliliter ampule. And what I know is there are 400 milligrams in every one milliliter of solution. Okay, so I need to know how many milliliters I need to give this person. Alrighty, so what am I looking for? My answer needs to have milliliters in it. So I'm gonna take this ratio, one milliliter divided by 400 milligrams. So that was given in the problem. And so I know that for every one milliliter of this Depravera I pull out of the container with my syringe, there will be 400 milligrams of this drug. Okay, so I have the unit. When I'm finished with this, my unit needs to be milliliters in my answer. I have the unit right where I want it. I wanted milliliters in the numerator. I have milliliters in the numerator. The problem is this milliliter unit came with grams. So milligrams, and I, I don't want that mass unit. I need to cancel that out. So how am I gonna do that? Well, this is a mass unit. This is a mass unit. So how do I cancel things out? I have one in the numerator, and in this case, one in the denominator. Okay, so great. That's, my, that's what I wanna put up there, so I can get those to cancel. I can't cancel uh, grams and milligrams out directly, so I'm gonna do a conversion. So for every 1,000 milligrams, that equals one gram. All right, so now look what we can do. Milligrams cancels, grams cancel. What unit do I have left? The only one I'm looking for, milliliters. So I can do the math on this. And let me grab a calculator. Uh, 0.35 times 1,000 divided by 400. And I get 0 0.875 uh, milliliters. My answer, since this is a two sig fig thing, is going to need to be 0 0.88 milliliters. That's what I'm going to be giving this person. Okay. So we didn't have an equation. We couldn't use an equation to calculate this. And so I needed to use the units and I manipulated the units to give me the answer that I want. And that's how the railroad track works. All right, that's the first way.